Christ is risen, he is risen indeed. Hallelujah. God be praised for this resurrection of our Lord Jesus. And we celebrated this resurrection tide, the 1991st anniversary of the event. Oh, dear YouTube theologians, I hope your week last week was full of joy and peace in believing and recounting these wonderful events. Uh, thinking about three things today on the Wednesday. Today's Wednesday, by the way. It's April 3rd today, which I think is um, the actual anniversary of the crucifixion. If you take the calendar days and you go back and put it on the, the days of the Jewish calendar in 33 AD, the 14th of Nisan, which was the day of the crucifixion, Friday, is April 3rd, I believe, and April 5th is the day of the resurrection. So today's, if you're counting on the calendar, not by week, but by month day, today would be the anniversary of the Lord's crucifixion, and Friday would be the anniversary of the resurrection. But we know it happened on Friday and Sunday. We celebrate it on the days of the week, which is really great. And it's not by accident that we count the days. I've been, like everything I've been emailing, thinking about, talking to the church, 1,991st. Next year, one th the 1992nd, then the 1993rd. Coming up in, 20, in 2033, the 2000th anniversary of the Lord's crucifixion and resurrection. And it's important, it's so important that first we know it's history. The, the, res the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus are history before their theology. It's an event before it's a doctrine. And this we cannot overemphasize because there's this tendency to make it a spiritual truth. I mean, it is. But to say that the, the, the truthiness of it doesn't matter, or the truth of it doesn't matter, it's truthy. You know that idea? Like, there's always these surveys that come out just to disappoint pastors, but hopefully to give them something to preach about that say, hey, if we found the body of Jesus, would you still be a Christian? And like every Christian says, well, yeah, of course, because I guess that doesn't matter in their mind. No, it ma this is what matters. Paul says, if Christ, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, our hope is in vain. Jesus promised he was going to be raised. If he wasn't raised from the dead, then he was lying. And th that um, we... <laughs> We are not followers of myths, made up nice stories. The Bible, from the beginning, presents itself to us as a history book. We have to, this is important. Ah, oh, man, I, I, I've been more and more convinced of the importance of this in the beginning. Genesis chapter one, two, and three, that we just treat it as plain old history because it, it gives itself to us as plain old history. And if we undo the history of it, then we start to lose everything. And this is especially true of the resurrection. I mean, all the way through that the Bible, that, that Jesus really is raised from the dead. And there's all these proofs, like for example, the grave clothes. Someone pointed this out to me this year. I think it's a really wonderful apologetic point that the spices that they would have used to anoint the body of Jesus would have attached these grave clothes to his skin. So you couldn't separate the body from the grave clothes uh, if Jesus was dead. And so if you were going to steal the body away, you wouldn't leave the grave clothes there. You couldn't. You would have, it would have ripped off and there would have been flesh on it and everything. So that the grave clothes are there without the body in them, that the, the, head, the veil over the head was folded and placed nicely there is an indication that Jesus was raised and passed through these grave clothes. You, it's a proof that the body wasn't stolen. Reading through the accounts of the resurrection this year, I noticed how careful the gospel writers are to note that Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of the Lord, the women, they noted the place where he was, uh, where he was buried. It's, it's and almost anticipating the idea, oh, well, they just couldn't find him. No, they knew where he was. And that would have been doubly marked because they would have sealed the tomb, which normally tombs wouldn't necessarily be sealed, at least this way. And they had a guard over the tomb so that, so that if there, there would have been no doubt, this is the grave of Jesus, this is where Jesus was, but it's empty. The grave, his tomb, is empty, still empty. And this fact is what, is what we base our faith on. 
it's not faith in the story of the resurrection. It's faith in the event of the resurrection, in the history of the resurrection, in the fact and the truth of the resurrection, captured in the Easter greeting, Christ is risen, he is risen indeed. Not he is risen maybe, or he is risen probably, or he is risen in our heart, or the truthiness of the resurrection gives me a lot of comfort. No, he is risen indeed in truth and history. You can put it on the calendar and you can celebrate the anniversary every year like we did. It's an amazing thing. I mean, these mysteries that on Good Friday, God died. Whew. And on Easter Sunday, man is raised from the dead. Never to die again. Even, you know, the, Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection, which is nice to think about because there's a lot of other people who were raised from the dead but then had to die. So they were resuscitated, I suppose, in the times of Elijah and Elisha, even in the ministry of Jesus. Peter and Paul resuscitated people, brought them back from the dead. Lazarus, for example. But Lazarus had to die again. Can you imagine the Jews were, that they were plotting to kill, John tells us, they were plotting to kill Jesus and Lazarus, both. Because of Lazarus' resurrection, all the people were following Jesus. So they said, well, we got to get rid of Lazarus too. Because everyone was there for his funeral, for his burial, and then for his resurrection. Like, whoa. But Lazarus had to die again. Can you, these, <laughs> the Jews plotting to kill him, they're like, hey, Lazarus, we're going to kill you. <laughs> and, and, and Lazarus is like, been there, done that. What is it you're supposed to say? Been there, done that, got the t-shirt. That's Lazarus. Been there, done that, got the grave clothes. <laughs> Lazarus, I'm going to kill you. And this is the Christian attitude. This oh, Okay, so now, okay, the fact of the resurrection, but now the theological result of the resurrection is this profound fearlessness of death. This is one of those marks of the Christians. They loved not their lives unto death. The pagans looking at the Christians like, what is wrong with you people? We can't scare you at all. We throw you to the lions, cut you apart with a sword, set you on fire. You Apparently, you're not afraid to die. Well, because Christ is risen from the dead and his resurrection from the dead totally transforms death. Before the, let me say it, not before. Apart from the death and resurrection of Jesus, death, is a fearful punishment and a horrible enemy. But through the death and resurrection of Jesus, the punishment is spent and the enemy is destroyed. We know that so I think our world I think our world is trying to trying to undo the power of death as an idea, so we just ignore it. And then if you think about it, you think, well, dead is dead. But we know that's not true. We know we live past death. There's this instinctive necessity for us to know that this life isn't the end. So then we say, okay, well, we go on to some sort of like fuzzy light place. I don't know. What do you think most people think, apart from the scriptures, that what happens to you when you die, you get absorbed in the light or something? And we know that's also not true. Our conscience tells us that, that, that there has to be a judgment after death. That all these miserable criminals don't just get away with it. That there's got to be some sort of reckoning and things made right. So we know that the human heart instinctively knows of a life after death that includes a judgment. But here's the problem. That's fearful. If you ever stop to think about it for a second, that is a fearful thing. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. It's appointed for man once to die and then to be judged. And I think even the most secular, pagan, non-thinking person, if you just get a, like a slight moment to reflect on this, that's what occurs. It's, but Jesus, this is the point of the cross, is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world and on the cross is receiving the punishment that you and I deserve for our sins so that now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We've passed from death to life. We will not come into judgment. That's Romans 8. That's John 5. That God has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's Isaiah 53. 
He was wounded for our transgressions, and the chastisement that brought us peace is upon him, so that his death is in our place, so that, that, so that death is a punishment, the wages of sin is death, on the day you eat of it, surely you will die. All of that is undone by Jesus. He says, okay, what you deserve is mine. Here comes the wrath of God towards me. And Jesus steps in. And it's on him instead of me. So that death is no longer a punishment, but a gift. To live as Christ, to die as gain. Death is now, uh, it's no longer the gloomy portal. <laughs> it's the way to life eternal. And that's the second point, that not only is death no longer a punishment, that it's, it's now for the Christian, in some ways, a reward. Well done, good and faithful servant. It's the way to eternal life. But the second thing is death is no longer an enemy. The last enemy to be conquered is death. Paul says that in 1 Corinthians 15. So that the final victory is this victory of our Lord Jesus over death. Now, death is this grave, you know, rah. This is the picture of that Luther gives us as death as the great consumer, devourer, just one after another. It's never satisfied. The grave is never satisfied. Just eating one after another after another until it gets to Jesus. And then, here's Luther on Easter. Death chokes on Jesus. The grave gets Jesus caught in the throat and it dies and spits Jesus up three days later. <laughs> so, oh, so, wow. So Jesus is the death of death. He's, Luther also will preach that he's the devil's devil. He's the, accu the, the accuser of the accuser, the destroyer of the destroyer, the enemy of our enemy. Th this is uh, the Isaiah 25 passage talking about the resurrection where we're sitting at this table eating this, <laughs> eating this beautiful feast, rich food on the marrow, I think that's like a bone-in steak. I don't know exactly. And rich wine. So you have the finest food, the finest meat, the finest drink, and you're there feasting, and you look down the table, and there's the Lord, and he's also eating, but he's eating something different. And so you lean over and you say, Lord, what are you eating? What do you got there? And he finishes his bite, and he says, oh, this? I'm just eating death. <laughs> the, 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 pay, the veil that covers all people, the Lord will swallow up on this mountain death. He he, <laughs> he's eating death. Hmm. Good. <laughs> Can you, you have to look at that, Isaiah 25, the picture is phenomenal. He, the Lord will swallow up death forever. I'm just eating the grave, devouring the devourer, the side of fried devil. <laughs> this is the Lord's conquering of, of death for us. Now you're going to be afraid of this? It's on the, the Lord is cutting up your death and eating it up with a fork. You're going to be afraid of that? This is your enemy, destroyed. Oh, so good. Oh, death. Remember Hosea? Paul is singing Hosea's song. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, grave, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But praise be to God who gives us the victory in our Lord Jesus Christ. He takes away the sting of death by forgiving sins. And he takes away the, the tyranny of death by his resurrection, which he also promises to us that one day our grave will be as empty as his. He's the first fruits. And on the last day, he'll harvest us as the rest of the fruits to live with him forever. Wow. 
that is Easter triumph and Easter joy. <laughs> Christ is risen. He has risen indeed. Hallelujah. Hey, two things I forgot to mention. Uh, we have a men's retreat coming up here at St. Paul Lutheran Church, April 19, 2021. Dr. Jordan Cooper is going to be talking about spiritual warfare against modern philosophy. That should be really great. I'll put the link to that in the description. And then the guys at Issues invited me to come uh, again to this year's Issues Etc. Conference. That'll be in Chicago, July the 13th, 12th and 13th. You say, hey, how can you be in Detroit at the International Lutheran Death Association on the 12th and then Chicago it's lucky that Detroit and Chicago are next to each other on the 12th that'll be not my first presentation in sign on the martyrs that'll be really great and then on Saturday the 13th at issues etc talking about making the case for uh, God keeping his promises that's a you know, we always talk about the promises of God but what are those promises what are the benefits of the promises what are the dangers of the promises uh, again making the case that that conference is fant fantastic and Chris I think Roseboro's gonna be there I think the Hemingways are gonna be there so all your favorites on issues etc that'll be that'll be just a great it's always a great conference that they put on and so I hope you can make it to that as well so see you soon but one other thing I forgot, we're doing the, also the singles cruise in August. This is all 2024 stuff, by the way, so if it's after that and you're watching old YouTube video, good for you, but I think we have now 80 plus signed up for the singles cruise in August, but we've had 130 information, so there's 50 of you who are in the application process, but more, hopefully, uh, more and more are gonna be coming to this. So Lutheran singles, ages 21 to 41, August 1st to 5th, that is also in the description, or I'm going to just remind me if it's not, and I'll put it there. And I uh, hope you can join Carrie and I cruising around, uh, meeting new friends, uh, having a good time on this singles cruise. That should be a lot of fun. If you meet someone on the singles cruise and you need uh, lights, party lights for the wedding, I got you covered. <laughs>